Good morning. My name is Anne Howie, and uh, I'll be doing the announcements today, but let's begin with our mission statement. To know the love of God and to share it through worship, service, fellowship, learning, and hospitality. Please note that there are handouts at the back as you come in either direction um, that do have printed versions of the uh, announcements because um, it's sometimes easier to remember email addresses and phone numbers if you've got them on paper. Uh, so you can always pick that up. Uh, Barb McGill is on study leave until February 21st, so today we welcome Janie Wilson to lead the service. Um, a couple of cancellations for tomorrow for family day, the office is closed, and the book group, which normally meets Mondays at 10 a.m., is canceled uh, for family day. Looking a bit ahead, the coldest night of the year walk is next Saturday, February 25th at 4 p.m. in downtown St. Catharines with two kilometer and five kilometer route, routes. Uh, snacks and soup um, are included. You can join Trillium's team and walk um, by contacting Brenda Lockhart, or you can donate to support the team either online or through team members. Um, tax receipts are being mailed, uh, and please note some of you will receive receipts dated January to May 31st. Others will have received those receipts already and will be issued receipts from June 1st to December 31st, 2022. Um, but the bottom line is by next week, you should have all receipts for the year 2022. Um, and I would just like to thank our treasurer, Lynn, um, because, you know, I can balance my checkbook, but I can't imagine trying to keep track of three different congregations in one tax year and getting all the receipts done. So thank you, Lynn. Um, also looking ahead for kind of year-end stuff, um, book the date. The annual meeting will be on Sunday, March 26, 2023. Um, details, more details will be forthcoming. I've also been asked to make an announce from, ma announcement from the pastoral search and selection team. Your search team is progressing nicely. We are registered for our first training from the Horseshoe Falls Regional Council, February 21st, 2023, and we'll provide another update after this time. Here is a reminder of those working on your search team, Betty Ann Chandler, Rose Day, Jerry Cunningham, and Barbara James, who is the chair. Please keep us in your prayers. I saved the food till last. Tuesday, February 21st, that's this Tuesday, um, Pancake Supper Shrove Tuesday, um, but we're combining that with Ash Wednesday worship service. So 5 p.m. is the pancake supper in Ruby Carroll Hall, and 6.30 p.m. is the Ash Wednesday worship service here in the sanctuary. Um, they are going to be serving pancakes and sausages. Gluten-free options will be available. Um, so. If you're afraid of gluten-free stuff, there's regular ones too, but <laughs> there are gluten-free options. Um, there's a free will offering um, as part of this. Um, that's a reminder that Lent is approaching and there will be various activities and opportunities to deepen our spiritual journey. Um, since I happen to be here making announcements, I'll mention that there will be two services of quiet reflection during Lent one February 28th and one March 28th, in each case at 11.30 a.m. until noon. Um, please join us for a time of readings, prayer, and quiet meditation. 
I think that's all the announcements that um, I need to make, but there is a celebration I've been asked to announce. Lori Thwaites and her daughter Candace Fortier are celebrating their same day birthdays on Friday, February 24th. Um, happy birthday. Are there other announcements or celebrations? Dave. Wow, Eve is 18, or about to be 18, and is uh, doing an audition today. So yes, happy birthday and best wishes to Eve. Other uh, announcements or celebrations? Let us prepare for worship. See a land acknowledgement there? We're gathered today to worship on the land that is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples, who have for thousands of years lived on this land, honoring the Creator and living with respect in creation. We acknowledge their stewardship of the land and their relationship with the land and its plants and animals, and the lakes and streams with their life forms throughout the ages. We accept the responsibility we have to seek and nurture relationship with Indigenous communities, to continue learning from our history, and to live in right relationship with one another and all of creation. sound? Yes. The sun rises above mountains and lights up valleys. We light this Christ candle this morning to remind us that the Son of God is with us in the highs and lows of life. As the candle continues to provide light, may we continue to walk in the light of the sun. Thank you, Anne. And now we join together in our call to worship. What does God require of you? What does our God require of you? My heart. My hands. My love. My life. What does our God require of us? That we use all of our gifts to do justice, to love kindness, and to travel humbly. 
Let us find inspiration and encouragement in God's presence. Together we, we worship our God. Our opening hymn this day is, This is the Day. Please stand as you are able. join in our opening prayer. We come to you today, God of the heights and valleys. It is difficult to climb to heights. Give us, Give us strength. It is hard to see the tops of mountains. Give us insight. There are often high winds and cold temperatures on mountaintops. Give us fortitude. From heights, we can see vistas not visible from the low plains. Help us appreciate the wideness of your world. It is calmer in the valley. Give us renewed rest. May this hour of prayer and worship open our eyes to the vision you see from our mountain. And let us continue as we sing the Lord's Prayer together. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you, Joan. As we move into our Learning Together time, we're again looking at something to do with Black History Month. In the process of my courses, one of the things that we touched on was having an inclusive congregation. And this involved including not only people of different ethnic backgrounds, but also different needs, disabilities, and trying to meet all these needs. To see a congregation that's basically, I thought of it kind of like a Christmas pudding. You know where you take all the ingredients in the kitchen and you put them together and you end up with something that's marvelous? Once a year. <laughs> well, I found out from watching this video that was actually chosen by Reverend Barb that there are other ways of thinking of inclusiveness. And so let's watch it now and see what we can learn from it. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty When you know your history and you preserve your history and you celebrate your history, then you have a very good chance of not repeating some of the mistakes of history. My name is Nancy Oliver McKenzie, originally from Nova Scotia, came to the Union United Church of Montreal for about the past 30 years, and I got quite involved in the history here. In 1902, there was a group created called the Colored Women's Club of Montreal, and they were the wives of porters, and they began a group to assist newcomers, Black newcomers, to Canada, to Montreal. Black people of, of Montreal were not <coughs> particularly comfortable in going into the churches that were already established here. So they met and decided to create their own church. And it was created in 1907, and it was called Union Congregational Church, and uh, which eventually became Union United Church in 1925. He's been a leader in many ways um, in terms of sanctuary, and of refugees in terms of the boycotting of uh, South African products when Mandela was in jail. And that resulted in Mandela coming to Montreal to Union United Church in 1990, actually. And he spoke from the pulpit of Union United Church, which is one of our, our, our proudest moments in the church. The diversity is what makes it stronger. And I think it's what holds union together. Let's join together in our next hymn, O Splendor of God's Glory Bright.
Let us pray. O oh God, you commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. Shine into our hearts through your holy word so that we may receive the knowledge of your glory in Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. The first reading from Peter's second letter, the first chapter and verses 16 to 21, Peter speaks about the transfiguration experience for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have this prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you have to understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came about by human will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became bright as light. And then suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is so good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and don't be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus all by himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. I'm sure you've often heard the phrase about mountaintops and molehills. And you've noticed probably in your order of worship that that's not the name of the sermon. Mountaintops and ant hills. I think we have a video loop that's going to be playing up ahead. And if you want to pay attention to that, fine. If you want to pay attention to this, okay. Before we dive into the scripture this morning, I'd like to do a little review. I know many of you know this, but I need an occasional reminder, so you're getting a reminder. Scholars tell us that the book of Matthew was written by a Jewish person for Jewish people. All of us are a product of our history. 
I have English background, and I was brought up with a heavy dose of English history and literature. As a result, I can fairly easily compare what's happening now with what happened in English history. And I'm thinking that those of you who came from a different ethnic background can do the same with your history and culture. Jewish people are no exception. They know their past and can fairly easily connect the present with the past. As a result, the book of Matthew can incorporate episodes from Jewish history as symbolic inserts into the present story that it's telling. We can't necessarily do that, so we may need to do some study and get some help to get the full message of Matthew. But you know what? There's a really good chance that Jewish people get it. The first four chapters of Matthew are really a quick overview of Jesus' life from birth to the time he started his ministry. During those four chapters, Matthew uses a technique repeatedly to tell us that something important is happening and we should pay attention. He uses angels and dreams to tell us that the story is moving forward. Starting in chapter 5, the technique changes a little. Instead of dreams and angels, Matthew uses mountains to gently and quietly say to his readers, Wake up, people, pay attention, this is important. Matthew mentions mountains more than any of the other gospel writers. For Jewish recipients of this story, this would very quickly tell them that mountains are part of their history. The Torah, the five books attributed to Moses, so important to Jewish culture and history and life, the Torah mentions mountains 72 times. And now to the scripture. The scripture reads, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. After six days. What happened a week earlier? That is where the story actually begins. The story is the great confession by Peter. Peter verbalizing his understanding that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is not just a teacher, not just a healer, not just a prophet. He is the promised Messiah. For Peter, as for anyone, this is huge. For Peter, this is what one might call a mountaintop experience. It had the potential to change his life. Unfortunately, the rock on Peter's mountain might have been a bit degraded, and Peter was on a slippery slope. Jesus began to tell the disciples that the way ahead was very difficult. It was the way of opposition, the way of confrontation. It was the way that would lead to another mountain. Golgotha. And Peter wasn't having any of that. He had a picture in his mind of the great and victorious Messiah. He saw a prophet, a great prophet, who would lead the Jewish people back to owning their faith, culture, and homeland. He probably saw Moses, or saw Jesus, as a new Moses a prophet who led the people to owning their faith, culture, and a new homeland. Peter wasn't very far removed from the vision of Judas. Scripture doesn't actually say so, but I'm presuming that James and John were thinking the same as Peter, and they needed to be sorted out. So Jesus took them up a mountain. Are you paying attention yet? What happens next is described by some translations of the Bible as a vision. It involved Jesus talking to two of the greatest characters in the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, a lawgiver and a prophet. It involved bright lights, perhaps a foretaste of the glorified Christ, 
perhaps a memory of the shine on Moses' face when he came down from Mount Sinai. It involved clouds. Again, a look back to the mount clouds on Mount Sinai. And no Jewish person could miss that symbolization. The vision involved a voice, something that the disciples could actually hear and understand. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. During the week, I had an opportunity to discuss this scripture passage with some friends. How did it make the disciples feel? How did it make us feel? The words excited, awe-inspiring, and scared came to mind. How does it make you feel? A sensitive sound today. At this point in his ministry, Jesus was well aware that his disciples couldn't always control fear, and especially when they didn't understand what was happening. And they were terrified. Typical. Jesus' response was also typical. He touched them. A gentle, healing touch. Then he led them from the mountaintop to the valley below. I wonder what the disciples could see from that mountaintop. People, small as ants, scurrying around doing their daily chores. I wonder what they did when they came down from the mountain. You see, some people have quiet places of prayer and revelationary visions on mountaintops, but people don't live on mountaintops. They live in valleys. The laughter and tears of life are in the valley. The ugliness of the garbage heap and the beauty of the well-tended garden are in the valley. The cry of a newborn baby and the sobs of the newly widowed are in the valley. The work, the activities of life are in the valley. The valley is kind of like an anthill with everybody scurrying around doing what they need to do. And it's where we all live. Consider what we would do in the anthill, the valley, if we had been on that mountaintop. One thought is that we would tell everyone we knew about this incredible experience. We would try to let them have the experience vicariously through us. But would anyone believe us? Is it too far-fetched? Would it detract from what people already knew about Jesus? Would it inflame revolutionary thoughts and actions that may be harbored by some of the other residents in the valley? Actually, that wasn't really a possibility, as Jesus had already cautioned the three disciples to not tell anyone about this until after the resurrection. And I have grave doubt that the disciples actually understood that caution at that time. But, and here it is, big but, they had been on a mountain and a voice had spoken directly to them, not to Jesus. This is my son, listen to him. They may not understand what Jesus is saying now, but listen to him. Eventually, the meaning will become clear. As I prepared the sermon this week, a piece of music came to mind, music that many of you know. The music was written by Handel, and the words he put to this music were, and the glory, the glory of the Lord will be revealed and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Transfiguration vision can be summed up in the words of that song, the glory of the Lord was revealed. Transfiguration Sunday is one of the high points or feast days of the church year. Because of that, the church has this symbolism, which you have in front of you, actually, the color white. 
You have it on the hangings. You have it here. It's a, a color of it's a mountaintop experience. It's a celebration. It's one of the high points or feast days of the church year. Next Sunday, we enter into the period of Lent. And this period is definitely not a mountaintop period, but rather a slow ascent to Golgotha. Then comes Resurrection Sunday, and we can all celebrate and talk about the glory of the Lord. Finally, Transfiguration Sunday makes sense and the glory of the Lord is revealed. After the Easter season comes a long period of time when the church looks at incidents and teachings from the life of Jesus. It's also a time for us to remember that three disciples, Peter, James, and John, were on a mountain and received a direct command a command that actually hands down to each of us today. Listen to him. In the valleys, in the anthills where we all live and work, it's important that we listen to him and respond to what we hear. We may not understand what Jesus is saying the first time, but listen to him. Eventually, we will understand. I also wondered this week about the difference between a dream and a vision. So I asked the biggest know-it-all of our time, Mr. Google. He knows everything. And this is what he said. Godly vision comes with divine knowledge and understanding. It allows us to have foresight from hindsight and eventually oversight of all that is happening around us. When God beams his light on us, we are transformed and energized to accomplish great supernatural feats. May it be so. The next hymn I'm hoping we all know it. God help us to treasure. More Voices 147. If you have books in front of you, feel free to use them. And now it's a time when we think about giving back to God.
Exactly. Let us pray. Loving God, when Jesus read from the writings, when Jesus read from the writings of Isaiah in the synagogue, he found his own job description. It was clearly outlined. He was to bring good news to those downhearted, freedom for those in so many types of prisons, charity for those who lacked understanding, help for anyone in need. As we offer our own gifts today, may they be used to continue Jesus' work. Amen. Generous and loving God, we bring our gifts to you this morning, praying that both givers and gifts will be transformed by you. Amen. Please be seated.
prayers of the people this morning. We recognize the flowers that have been placed in the sanctuary this morning by Sharon Sharp in loving memory of her mother and father, Ken and Madeline Sharp. And now, let us pray together. Holy One, we come together in these prayers of the people, acknowledging our need for each other. For it is in community that we find the courage and strength to live each day to make a difference in our world. This morning we've been up the mountain through singing of hymns, listening to God's word and being fed by Jeannie's message. And now we are asked to take that message of love to a world that is waiting. People we bump into at the grocery store, or see in the neighborhood, or talk to those who are around the corner from our own homes. Give us the courage, holy mystery, to walk into a strange place and find allies. To pick up the phone to call someone who has come to mind. To be ready to move into the future and find it a place of joy where people, all people, will be safe and warm, fed and educated their spirits rising like eager kites in your good wind. Our thoughts and prayers continue to be with the people of Turkey and Syria, who have lost so much this past week. We can't imagine the devastation, the loss that they are experiencing every day. And we give thanks for the people and organizations that have responded to this disaster. We also remember families in our own country who are grieving the loss of a child, a parent, a loved family member, a friend. And today we especially hold the family of Muriel Bennett in our prayers. And now we bring our own needs for your support and guidance. We all have aches and pains, some of the body, some of the soul. We have hopes that have been dashed, assumptions about the way the world is that have melted away like a disappearing glacier. Help us to find the support we need to meet each day with hope. And thank you for the opportunities to care, to listen and share without trying to fix things, to sit with friends in the midst of death, job loss, or financial hardship in the midst of feelings of depression, loneliness, or uselessness, in the midst of relationships shattered through crime, separation, divorce, mental illness, or physical disability. Thank you for your overwhelming, unconditional, ever-present love, which shapes and nurtures and heals us. Bless us, we pray, in the name of the one who walks with us in resurrection hope. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'd like to thank everybody who helped with this service this morning. From Anne, Daryl, the choir, tech people, and most definitely Joan, thank you. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many people and how much time actually goes into a one hour worship service, but it's okay. And now, may the beauty of God be, re be reflected in your eyes. The love of God be reflected in your hands. The wisdom of God be reflected in your words. And the knowledge of God flow from your hearts that all might see and seeing believe. Go now in peace. <laughs>